started. Okay, we are live. Uh, apologies for being a, a minute or so late. Uh, like I said, uh, my computer decided to do a Windows update right before I started. Um, okay, let's get started. Um, I don't have it here on the slide, but one thing I did want to mention is that uh, we do have a second celebration coming up. So not next week, but the week after. We're going to do our exam review Monday and then our next exam on Wednesday, which will be on the, basically, if, if exam one was about forces, exam two is about moments. Uh, it'll be on rigid body systems. And then what we're starting today, which is rigid body uh, equilibrium, uh, which is a pretty natural extension of uh, what we did during the last couple of lectures. Um, we're going to spend a few days on this, but if you understood what we did up until now, then, then today I think will feel pretty natural. Um, what we're going to do today is discuss uh, uh, not trying to come up with equivalent system, you know, a, a system of forces such that the forces and moments in system one equal the forces and moments in system two. Instead, what we're going to try and do is ensure that the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments in a given system is zero, because that, is, that would mean that the system is in static equilibrium. So um, what we're going to be doing today essentially is talking about something called a support reaction. Um, I have here on the slide, this is an image from the textbook, and this has uh, a number of the different support conditions that you would have in two dimensions. Um, uh, admittedly, today, we're not going to use all of these. In fact, we're only going to use a, a few of them. Uh, the idea is that these are the support conditions that we as engineers uh, utilize uh, when modeling a structure. And that, that'll become clear uh, uh, here, here in a little bit. Um, what I want to do is I want to start off, uh, you know, I think by now you probably recognize I'm, I like to recap. So I want to recall the, the idea of an equivalent system of forces. So um, what, you know, the idea behind that was that we wanted to develop, uh, you know, we, we have a problem and we have a, a body that's subjected to all sorts of forces going in all sorts of different directions. And we wanted to develop a, um, a system such that the, the forces and moments in, let's say, system one were equal to the force and forces and moments in system two. And that means that those systems are equivalent. Um, uh, and that's a natural uh, uh, thing to study because it gets you, uh, gets your sleeves rolled up and gets you uh, working in forces and moments and understanding how to uh, systems share uh, equivalent forces and moments. And, and why do we care about forces and moments? Well, if you have all of your forces all meeting at a common point, um, you can recognize that that system is in static equilibrium if the sum of the forces are zero. And so if you, if you remember, uh, uh, in the, like at the end of chapter two, right before the first exam, uh, what we were doing is, let's, you might remember that balloon problem that we had, uh, and that's a, a good one to talk about, because we had a balloon that was floating up in the air, and then we had three cables uh, tethering it to the ground. And the idea was, what are the tensions in those three cables in order to attain equilibrium. So, you know, we had the balloon going up and we had the tensile uh, uh, components in each cable and it was a three equations, three unknowns problem. And we would solve for what are those tensile forces to achieve static equilibrium. And at the time, we only had three equations that we had to deal with. We had the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero, and the sum of the forces in the z direction equals zero. And for all of the forces all meeting at a common point, that's enough. There are, there are no moments. But when your uh, forces don't meet at a common point, uh, when you've got forces act over the place, like a really good example is to just look at, you know, the problem we're about to deal with, which is this problem right here. This is a beam, okay? This is a, one of the most fundamental analyses that engineers can do, particularly civil engineers. I have a beam and it's subjected to a series of loads. I have a 20 kip load here, a 30 kip load here, and an 18 kip load here. Um, and so, you know, this, this is something that, that a civil engineer might deal with. And so the question becomes, you know, what is, you know, this force right here? What is this force right here? And what is this force right here? And I'll show you here in a little bit about how I identify that in a second. But what are those forces to ensure that that beam is not moving, that that beam uh, is in static equilibrium. That's one of the first tasks uh, that an analyst has when dealing with uh, uh, rigid body systems is, you know, what are the forces uh, to keep that system uh, in equilibrium? And so what we're talking about in, uh, in statics land is this. Uh, 
you know, in equivalent systems, what we were trying to do is ensure that the forces and moments in system one equals the force and moments in system two. Now we need to ensure that the system is in equilibrium. So I mean that the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments in a given system are zero. Now in three dimensions, that's six equations, six unknown. So, I mean, you know, if you had a six, if you truly did have a six by six system, that is definitely something that your Casio FX115 ES Plus uh, wouldn't be able to handle on its own. Um, you'd have to break out some some software, maybe like uh, uh, MATLAB or Excel. Excel can actually handle uh, 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 systems of simultaneous equations. And maybe I'll, I'll show you that later on. Um, but a lot of times as structural engineers, we try and take a, uh, a, a three-dimensional system and when possible, we try and idealize it as a two-dimensional system. Now, first off, if you're dealing in two dimensions, you're going to take your, you know, you're not going to have three uh, force equations, you're only going to have two, you know, some of the forces in the X direction, some of the forces in the Y direction. As for moments, why is it that you go from three moment expressions to one? Well, the reason why is, is, you know, what we did with moments in two dimensions. If you remember, you know, we would have a moment expression. Remember, moments is R cross F. And when you take R cross F and you only deal with forces in two dimensions, you know, you only end up getting that one moment expression. Remember, if you take a force vector, you know, FXI plus FXJ or FYJ and then cross, uh, cross F uh, or maybe RXI plus RYJ and you do R cross F, you only end up with a moment. Uh, 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 in the Z direction. You only end up with a K component uh, for that moment. So in two dimensions, we only have three equations of, of equilibrium that we need to deal with. We need to ensure that the sum of the forces in the X direction equals zero, the sum of the forces in the Y direction equals zero, and the sum of the moments uh, about the, the Z axis equals zero. And really what, what we're going to see here in a second, what that really means is the sum of the moments about really any arbitrary point in the system, because you know, ultimately, if I'm looking at the beam on the board, I really don't care where I see some moments. I just don't want the beam to rotate. And so we need to develop uh, uh, our, our, you know, unknown forces, which we're going to talk about here in a second, such that we meet uh, these requirements. So we're going to have three equations, uh, three unknowns in, in two dimensions. Now, in order to start doing these problems, uh, and, and in order to, to, to really have, have a discussion about this, we need to start talking about this uh, concept of boundary conditions. What are boundary conditions? Um, so I'm curious, I, I'm sure that there's probably um, people in the class that, that, I'm sure there's probably one or two of you that have had differential equations. Chances are most of you have not. Um, most of you have probably had like calculus one, maybe you're in calculus two right now or calc three, something like that. Uh, but I can explain boundary conditions pretty easily from a math perspective, and I can also explain it pretty easily from an engineering perspective. Let me give you the math, math uh, the mathematician's uh, perspective. Okay, um, let's uh, let's uh, 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 ask chat. Okay, what is the integral of let's let's do a calculus question. What's the integral of two x with respect to x? Wake everybody up on this Friday. Like, oh no, he's doing calculus. What's the integral of x squared or of, of 2x? Oh God, I just told you. <laughs> now, Mr. Ashworth, Mr. Wetzel, and Mr. Page are wrong. What did Mr. Brown say? Ah, plus c. That is right. Don't forget that arbitrary constant of integration. You are exactly that's that's the kicker, right? And whenever you do an indefinite integral, you end up with arbitrary constants of integration. You know, so the integral of 2x squared is x squared plus c. Okay. Now that's your general, you know, solution for that integral. If you want a, a specific solution for that integral, you would apply a boundary condition. So you'd say, okay, here's my integral, but I know that that function equals zero when x equals zero. And so I'd say, okay, at x equals zero, the function equals zero, and I'd plug and chug and I'd solve for c. And so that's how, I, if I if I actually wanted a specific answer for c, I would use I need a boundary condition to know that, you know, at x equals zero, the function equals this, or at x equals three, the function equals this, whatever. And that's the mathematician's perspective on boundary conditions. And, and uh, the reason I mention that is because, um, you know, your boundary conditions are going to become a thing all throughout your math courses, especially in the, 
the, the field of differential equations because when you solve differential equations, you don't have one arbitrary constant, you usually have a lot of them. And so you end up needing a fair amount of boundary conditions to solve for all of them. And sometimes those boundary conditions involve not just the function, but the derivative and the second derivative and all that stuff. Okay, but that, that, that's, that's enough math, uh, uh, calculus land for today. What are boundary conditions from the engineer's perspective? Well, they kind of re refer to the same thing. Uh, if I'm being technical, a lot of times engineers refer to boundary conditions with respect to deflections and deformations. We're not really talking about deflections and deformations in static because this is a rigid body mechanics course, but I think the idea is kind of the same. Um, what I mean by boundary conditions, uh, sometimes uh, I'll use the term support conditions. And so, so if I have a, a, an element that I'm looking at, a beam, a column, a, a truss, a frame, a machine, a whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I need some uh, 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 understanding of how that structure is attached to the ground. And I put that term in quotations for a reason. Uh, and these, these supports are the main components that keep the structure in equilibrium. So for example, I'm looking here, I'm sure that you all probably recognize this picture. I took this picture a few weeks ago. This is outside the uh, engineering building at Marshall. And this is the canopy that, uh, that uh, covers the, uh, you know, between the two engineering buildings, uh, the old and the new engineering building. Uh, and so uh, when I say boundary conditions or support conditions, I could be talking about the one in the background. And so I, you can see I've got this arrow pointing to the, uh, the connection between the column and the ground. And so uh, you might ask yourself, okay, I've got this column connecting into the ground. What are the forces and moments that are generated by a connection like that? And, and I propose they're gonna be different than the forces and moments that might be generated uh, at a connection like this, like you see here up top. Uh, another thing to add, you know, mention is when I say the ground, the ground may actually mean the ground, the physical ground. It also might be the next adjacent element. You know, a lot of times in structural engineering land, and I know there's probably a couple of mechanicals in here, forgive me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a structural engineer, but um, sometimes, you know, when we're analyzing structures, we take sort of a hip bone connected to the leg bone type of approach. So for instance, if I'm looking at, let's say this beam right here, uh, the ground, quote unquote, for this beam is actually this beam, right? Because it's like a hip bone connected to the leg bone thing. This beam connects into that beam, and then that beam connects to the column, and then the column connects to the ground. And so you can, you know, use that hip bone, uh, leg bone approach. And the idea is, if I'm looking at those support conditions, what are the unknown forces and the unknown or uh, the, the the types of supports? Uh, that we deal with. And this is really important because if you don't understand those types of supports, you're not going to be able to perform uh, the, the structural analysis and perform the analysis to determine your, uh, your, your uh, forces that keep the structure in equilibrium. Now, like I said at the beginning of the slide, I had a bunch of these. There's a bunch of different types of supports that we deal with in, in engineering applications. I'm only going to focus on a few of them today because uh, I just want to keep it simple. Um, I, I want to start off by talking about, I want to talk about three support conditions. The first is uh, a pinned support condition. Um, and so first off, let me, let me back up a little bit before I start talking about these support conditions. And this is a point, I, I actually go into this in a little bit more detail in some of my statics course, or not my statics course, but my structural analysis course. Um, I, I want to be clear that, that what we're talking about um, are conditions that do represent real life, but we're also talking about these analysis tools that we as engineers utilize. You know, for, for instance, next uh, year, uh, you know, you civil engineer are going to take structural analysis, and you're going to have the most awesome professor ever. Uh, uh, just to, uh, I'm talking about me. Um, <laughs> um, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, or maybe I'm not. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but um, one of the points I make in that class is that. Uh, we don't really analyze structures. We analyze these mathematical models that represent structures. And so a lot of the tools that we recognize, we have to recognize that there, there a lot of these are, are mathematical abstractions that we use to make analysis doable and to make it uh, easier. And, and the point I'm making is sometimes if, if you're an engineer and you're looking at, let's say, this beam, you know, let's take this beam in the upper right hand corner, you know, nobody's going to tell you, okay, that's a pen boundary condition or that's a fixed boundary condition. 
it's going to require your understanding of behavior and your understanding of, of, of how the physics works. And you're going to be required to look at that and go, okay, that's a pin support. That's a, a roller support. That's a fixed support. Uh, and as you progress later on in your, uh, uh, in your engineering curriculum, you know, we talk about this, like for instance, if you take steel design, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, what is a simple support, what is a fixed support, so that when you're analyzing a structure, you know which one uh, to utilize. Uh, but I digress a little bit. Uh, for now, I just want to sort of define these support conditions, uh, and then we'll use those definitions to do some problems. So first off, our pin support conditions. These uh, restrict motion in the X and Y direction, but they allow rotation. So the, the easiest physical example to think of is kind of like a hinge. Like if I look at the image here on the bottom, uh, you, you know, this is, again, it operates like a hinge. It, you know, I could yank on that, you know, pull it in the X direction or pull it in the Y direction all day long, and it's not going to move, but it's going to freely allow rotation. So when I look at, whenever I have a, a, uh, a support condition that, that's like this, I'm going to have uh, X and Y uh, unknown forces, but I'm, uh, I'm not going to have an unknown moment, okay? Now that's gonna be a little different than uh, rollers and then um, fixed supports, which we'll talk about later. Now, roller support conditions, uh, the difference between a pin support condition and a roller support condition is rollers only restrict motion in the direction of the roller. Um, admittedly, the symbol that we use can be a little deceptive because a lot of times you'll just see it written like a circle, like a, almost like a wheel. But know that uh, roller support conditions can have vertical reactions that go both upwards and downwards. You know, you can have a positive or negative uh, uh, reaction there. And, and I know when you see the, the image, like how does a wheel have a negative reaction? That doesn't make sense. Like if I had a negative reaction, the wheel would just sort of pick up off the ground. It's like, yeah, I, I think just the symbol that we use is, um, uh, can sometimes be a little deceptive. But again, the, key, the idea is that there's only one known unknown force. It just doesn't really matter what direction that's in. Um, now, a lot of times, and you, you might hear me use this terminology, if you ever have a beam like the one that we're talking about today, this is a beam that has a pin boundary condition on one end and a roller boundary condition on the other. Um, commonly, we refer to those as simple supports. If you ever hear somebody use the term a simply supported beam, what they mean is one that has a hinge boundary condition on one end and a roller boundary condition on the other. It's, it's one of the most uh, common boundary conditions that we use uh, in engineering applications. And so uh, uh, we tend to explore that quite a bit, not just in here, but uh, if you take me for, or when you take me for structural analysis, we're going we're gonna to talk about that a lot in there. Um, What's not so simple is a fixed boundary condition. Uh, fixed boundary conditions, these are ones, like the, the, the easiest way to, to think about this is one where you are fully and completely connecting your member, or maybe something like what was going on in the uh, uh, column on the, uh, uh, pull back the image here, the column outside the, the engineering building. Like this, this boundary condition that's right here, this one in the background, um, this is a, a column that's been encased into the concrete. So not only, uh, if I was analyzing that, I might be, you know, prevented to uh, idealize that as a fixed boundary condition. Not only is it um, uh, uh, preventing translation, like it can't move, but it can't rotate. But that also might depend on how deep that, that column is uh, in, in order to make that, uh, uh, that determination. And so whenever you see a fixed support, it's going to have three unknown boundary, uh, unknown uh, 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 reactions. It's going to have a force in the X direction, a force in the Y direction, uh, and an unknown moment, a concentrated moment uh, there at the, uh, uh, at the support. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to explore computing support reactions for these three situations. Um, and I'm, we're going to start off by doing problems in two dimensions. And so Today might be a short day, but I think it's important to sort of take what we do today and, and, and digest it, make sure that it's important. This is really foundational stuff in the world of structural analysis. This is, this is really important. And so what we're going to do is compute. We, I've got two problems. I've got this problem here. Uh, this, is our, uh, this is our beam problem that, that I mentioned. It's the same one that's here on, on the board. And then I've got one that's a little bit more involved, not really any difficult, just uh, any more difficult, just a, a, a little bit more to it. Um, so any questions before I start talking a little bit about this, this first problem?
All right. Um, let me uh, let me stop the share a little bit or for a second, uh, and let's talk about the problem. So here's the the problem. I have a uh, 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 you know a simply supported beam, and again, that's that terminology I mentioned earlier, where we have a roller condition on one end and a, a pinned condition on the other end. It doesn't matter uh, if I say a beam simply supported. You know, this could be the roller, this could be the hinge. You know, from terminology perspective, that really doesn't matter because think about it like this. If I standing on this side of the beam, I see the uh, the pin on the left and the roller on the right. If I could just look at this this way, I would see the roller uh, on the left and the pin on the right. It, but it's still the same beam, so it really doesn't matter w w what side those are on. Okay. Now, the first thing that you want to do whenever you're uh, analyzing a uh, a problem in order to determine its support reactions is you need to identify the boundary conditions and you need to look at what unknowns am I going to be dealing with. Whenever you're assessing equilibrium of a rigid body, the idea is to determine those unknown reactions to keep the structure in equilibrium. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this roller and I'm going to say, okay, this is a roller. Rollers have an unknown reaction in the direction of the roller. They only have one. Uh, and so what I'm going to do, and I'll talk about the direction here in a second, but I'm going to draw this unknown force. We'll draw it upwards. And we'll say BY is something. I don't know what BY is yet, but I, I, I know that there's going to be a reaction there. Uh, as for this one right here, this is a hinge. So or a pin. I'll use the term hinge and pin uh, interchangeably. Uh, roller conditions have uh, just a one unknown reaction in the direction of the roller. Pin or hinge boundary conditions have two unknown reactions. So there's going to be not just a vertical reaction. So we'll call this uh, AY it is unknown. But there's also going to be a horizontal reaction. And so right off the bat, I think you should recognize what we've got going on in terms of our, our static equilibrium. Because remember, this is a 2D problem, okay? Whenever there's 2D problems, we have three equations and three unknowns, right? And so our three unknowns are this, this, and this. And then our three known equations are going to be the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction equals zero, and then the sum of the moments are going to be zero. Now, technically that's the moments about the z-axis, but a lot of times we'll just write it like this because what we really mean is that the sum of the, sum of the moments about, really, about any arbitrary point has to be zero. In other words, the sum of the moments about that point has to be zero, about that point, that point, that point, that point. The, the sum of the moments need to be zero across the entire system. So three equations, three unknowns, and so this is going to be a pretty straightforward problem. Now, let's talk about a couple things. First off, um, let's talk about the direction. Now, if you notice, I drew the re vertical reactions upward, and I drew the horizontal reactions to the right. Now, why did I do that? Okay, well, first off, uh, maybe what we do is we just incorporate uh, positive sign convention. So you know, if you have a coordinate system like this, this is the uh, this is the uh, the x-axis. This is the y-axis. Positive x uh, values always go to the right. Positive y values always go up. And so maybe what you do right off is say, I'm just going to draw everything according to their positive sign convention. And if I get a negative answer, that means it goes downward, and that's completely fine. Uh, the the point, though, that I want to make is, is I want you to try and not get married to the initial choice that you make at the beginning of the problem. What I'm doing here when I draw my reactions this way is I'm sort of making a guess. I, I'm guessing that AY acts upward and BY acts upward. That's a guess I'm making at the beginning of the problem. I will do the math to figure out what these values are. And if I get a negative answer, Let's say I guess that this is upward and I get a negative answer. It doesn't mean I need to develop significant emotional distress. It just means I guessed it's upward and I got a negative answer. I was wrong. It's downward. Okay. So, so, so there's that. Um, 
For now, what we're going to do is be pretty formal about it. I think we're always going to assume that our vertical reactions are upward, our horizontal reactions are always going to be to the right. As for moment reactions, we'll pretty much always assume that those are uh, counterclockwise, because again, positive x to positive y, that's counterclockwise uh, uh, rotation. Uh, as you get more proficient in uh, computing support reactions, and uh, as you get more proficient in, uh, and I'm, I see that question, I'm gonna answer that here in a second. Uh, as you get more proficient in, um, in doing these types of uh, problems, you'll get a little better at guessing. You'll be able to look at a beam and go, okay, I see that, that's gotta be downward. And so you'll be able to guess downward. And, and th that's fine, again, as long as the math checks out. Now, there was a question from Mr. Adams about, uh, do you want us to flip the arrows when we get a negative? You don't really need to flip the arrows here. I'm not really worried about that. What I do want to see, and, and don't, please don't pick these numbers to the bank. I'm just making this up. Let's say that AX is 20 kips, AY is 90 kips, and BY is 18 kips. When you say, like, let's say this, if you were to tell me that that's the answer, I would be very upset because what I want to see when there's the answer, I want to see that this is 20 kips that way. I want to see that this is AY that way. I want to see that this is BY that way. In other words, whenever you indicate your final answer, make sure that you've got a magnitude and the direction. And, and the easiest way to do that is just say it's 20 kips to the right. It's 90 kips up, it's 18 kips down. Just make sure that you're completely crystal clear here when you spell out your answer. You don't necessarily need to flip them here. In fact, I kind of don't want you to do that because I don't want you to confuse yourself. Just make an assumption, go with it. If you get a negative answer, just tell me what the final answer is here. Does that, did that make sense? Good deal, okay. Now, I'm going to do some of this problem on the whiteboard, and then I'll do some of it on the, the notebook on the screen, because I really want to go through this and make sure that it's clear. Okay, so I have three equations, and I have three unknowns. Okay, so let's talk strategy. Okay, first thing, if I, if I wanted, I could just start writing out every one of these one at a time. Uh, and then come up with the three equations, three unknowns, break out my matrix solver on the Casio, and, and I'd get the answer. But the nice thing about a lot of uh, 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 rigid uh, body equilibrium problems is you can be a bit choosy and a bit strategic and creative in how you approach the problem, okay? Now, let me show you how. Okay, so let's take a look at this beam, okay? Now, I have, how many unknowns do I have that are vertical, that are in the Y direction? one, two. I have two unknowns in the vertical direction. What about in the horizontal direction? I only have one, okay? So because I have only one unknown horizontal, I'm going to deal with this equation first, the sum of the forces in the x direction. So here's how I'm gonna do this, okay? Let's write out the sum of the forces in the x direction. Let's write out that equation. Let's use that equation. Now, in order to write this out in an, in an equation format, I need to develop a sign convention. And so for forces in the x direction, what I'll do is I'll say that all the forces acting to the right are positive, okay? And I could write the equation as forces to the left are positive. It doesn't matter. I'm just gonna, you know, roll with it. Let's just pick one and go with it. As long as you're consistent, uh, the, the answers will wash out. And I look at the system and I just sum up all of the forces that are going in the X direction. And how many forces are going in the X direction? Does it, it chat, help me out. How many, what do you see going in the X direction? AX, exactly. And that's it, right? So AX has to be zero. That's it. All right, so what is one of my unknowns? AX equals zero. There you go. Pretty simple, right? All right, now for the sake of, of discussing and, and discussing the strategy, that's, uh, okay, so that's some of the forces in the X direction, so we've used that one, okay? For the sake of exploring this strategy, let's 
use the next one. Let's sum forces in the y direction. And in order to sum forces in the y direction, in order to write this equation, I'm going to take upward forces to be positive. Okay? So let's take upward forces to be positive, and let's just write this out. So I have AY is going up. First off, this force, we ended up determining that force was zero, so that, that's pretty easy. And plus, but it's also horizontal. We wouldn't consider it anyways. So I've got AY is going upwards, minus 20 kips is going downwards, minus 30 kips is going downwards, minus 18 kips is going downwards, plus BY, okay? And that has to equal zero. And so if I wanted to simplify this problem a little bit to do some algebra to simplify it, so 20 and 30 gives you 50, 50 and 18 gives you 68. So if I move this over to the other side, I get AY plus BY is 68 kips. Now, does anybody have any questions before I move on? Okay. Now, here's the thing. This first equation here, well, maybe we'll call this equation one and call this equation two. Equation one gives us an answer, like AX equals zero. All right. But equation two does not. Equation two tells us that whatever AY is and whatever BY is, we know that when we add them up, they better be 68. But it doesn't tell us what AY and BY are independently, right? This could be 50 and that could be 18. This could be 30 and this could be 38. This could be 70 and this could be minus two. Like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell us. So we need another equation. Well, now we need to do the sum of moments. Now, here, here's where we get a bit strategic, and this is where we, we try and get creative with our, with our computations. I want to be clear. We can sum moment. So let, let's, let's go about this process. Whenever we sum moments, we always sum moments about a particular point of interest, right? All of those problems that we did with uh, uh, rigid body systems, we would say, you know, what are the moments about point A? What are the moments about point B? What are the moments about some arbitrary point? We can sum moments about any here. It doesn't matter. We can pick any point we want because we're trying to determine what are these forces such that moment equilibrium is maintained in the whole structure. But I want to be choosy about it. Remind me, how do we define a, a moment? It is a force multiplied by a moment arm, right? It's a moment arm. So here's a point. Here's a point. If I have a force going through that point, I generate no bending moment from that force, okay? And if that's the case, why don't I write my moment equilibrium equation at either A or B? Now, why would I choose A or B? Because one of my unknowns, or really two of my unknowns, goes through A or B, right? So if I sum moments at A, I can just neglect this. I don't have to worry about it because AY goes directly through this point. Does that make sense? Let's uh, let's let's transition to the notebook a bit because I wanna I wanna chug this out you know sort of together. Okay, so here's the problem, and let's let's sort of very very quickly recap where we've where we've gotten so far. So. We have an AY, we have a BY, and we have a drawn in the positive direction. I sum forces in the X direction, taking forces to the right as positive, 
and it told me that AX equals zero. Yay. I sum forces in the Y direction. I take upward forces to be positive, and I got that AY plus BY minus 68 kips is zero or AY plus BY is 68 kips. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum moments about point A. Now, to be clear, there's nothing special about summing moments at point A. I could sum moments about point B, or I could sum moments about any point. The answer will still come out the same because, again, the math doesn't care where you sum moments about. The forces have to be, you know, have to be what they are in order to achieve equilibrium for the system as a whole. But to keep things simple, I'll sum moments uh, at zero. Now, in order to do this, just like with the others, I have to adopt a sign convention. Let's take counterclockwise moments to be positive, all right? And in order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of keep our eye fixed on this point right here. So that's our eye. You know, these are our eyelashes, what have you. And we're going to keep our eye focused there, and we're going to take each one by one and write out our moment expression. Now let's start off with AX and AY. Do AX and AY cause any moment to be generated at point A? The answer is no, because they go right through A. So we just need to start with each of these, uh, 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 these loads that are applied on top of the beam. So let's start off with the 20 kips. Let me ask you a question. Does that 20 kip moment or that 20 kip uh, load does it generate a positive bending moment at A or a negative bending moment at A? Negative, exactly right. And how far is it from A? What is the moment arm from A? Six feet. Exactly right. And there's our moment. Moving on. The 30 kips, positive or negative moment? How far from A? What is the moment arm from A? Exactly right, 15 feet. Somebody help me out with the next one. Just tell me the next one, the whole thing, whole expression. Minus 18 kips times what? There we go. And then we're going to have BY times looks like 30, but is that going to be positive or negative? There we go. And that's got to equal zero. Summing all the, the forces, all the summing all the moments, and that equals zero. And so let's take this one at a time, okay? What is 20 times 6? 20 times 6 is 120, so minus 120. And this is a moment, so these are foot kips. Minus 30 times 15 is 450. Minus uh, 18 times 22 is at 396. Let me know if I uh, uh, get a, a calculation error here. Plus BY times 30 equals zero. And notice how I only have one unknown, just BY. So this is just going to be like, you know, algebra at this point. So 120, 450. So what is that? Minus 966 plus BY times 30 is zero. And so maybe I ought to move the 966 over to the other side of the equation and divide by 30.
and that's positive by the way, 32.2 kips. Did anybody else get that? Just to make sure I didn't screw anything up. There we go. All right. So this is equation one. This is equation two. By is positive 32.2 kips. That's equation three. So help me out, because uh, I'll, I'll just use the same terminology I did before. How do we solve? So what do we know? We know AX equals zero. We know BY is 32.2. How do we solve, or how do, we know AX and BY. How do we solve for AY? Plug it into equation two, exactly right. And so, so using equation two, AY plus BY is 68 kip. And then AY, BY was positive 32.2 kips uh, equals 68. Oh, hold on. is positive 35.8. And so I got here as well. And so to be clear, when I express the answer and when I, when I see you all express the answer, this is kind of what I want to see. AX is zero. AY came out as positive 35.8 kips and the positive means that it's upward. BY was positive 32.2 kips, which means that it's upward. That's what I want to see. That's not so hard, is it? Pretty simple. Any questions on that before we move on to this next one? And admittedly, I'm going to try and knock it out as quick as I can, but um, I might ask for your a little bit on this one. Excuse me. Okay, now let's talk about this next one real quick. So if you understood the last one, this next one is really no harder. It's just another problem, if, if we're being honest. Okay, so I have a fixed crane that has a mass of 1,000 kilograms, and it's used to lift a box that's 2,400 kilograms right off the bat, okay? Uh, kilograms, these are not masses. We're, we're not dealing with masses. We're dealing with forces, so we need to convert those to weights, we need to multiply those by gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared, in order to develop a, uh, a, a force, okay? Now, it's held in place by a pin at A and a roller at B, okay? And the, the crane has a mass of 1,000 kilograms, and what we're saying here is that the, the center of gravity is at G. Now, now, what that means is whenever we perform our equilibrium analysis, and we apply our forces, we need to assume that that force from the weight of the crane just is applied at G. And that actually introduces a new term, the center of gravity. And I'm sure some of you probably heard that term just like in common parlance. Um, we're gonna later on talk about exactly how to like where the center of gravity is for a good body. That's gonna be kind of important. Um, we'll do that later. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into this problem. Uh, first off, uh, you know, here's the here's the structure. Uh, you know, always you know, you know, convert your you know mass times gravity. So a thousand kilograms 
times 9.81 meters per second squared is, you know, uh, 9,810 newtons or 9.81 kilonewtons. Does the center of gravity have to do with centroids? Yes, it does. Um, and centroids is something that we'll talk about a little later. I, 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 I had in the schedule that we were going to talk about centroids at the end of the semester. I've been toying around with the idea of actually doing it right after exam two. The more I think about it, I'm actually tempted to do that. Whether we do centroids now or we do it later on doesn't really matter, but we do need to do it uh, before the semester's over. But the short answer is yes. Oh, yes, it does. For a, an object of a constant density or a constant unit weight, the centroid and the center of gravity are at the same place. Have you done centroids in another course? Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll be deriving some. Uh, we'll be deriving some uh, 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 formulas for centroids uh, later on. It's an incredibly important topic in statics. Okay. So I just converted these to uh, uh, weights, and we're actually we're actually running really short on time here. Um, what I might do for this, because we're running short on time, if you understood this problem, here's what I'm gonna do. Here, this is what I'm gonna do. Now here's the the structure, right? And, and for the sake of discussion, it actually doesn't really matter what the structure looks like. The structure could just be a big blob out in space. But I know that I have a force right here that is equal to 9.81 kilonewtons. And it's acting downward because that's the weight of the crane. And then I have another force acting downwards right here. That is 23.544 kilonewtons, okay? Now, I have a roller right here, which puts out a force like that. This is By. And then I have a hinge, and it kind of goes like this. And so that's going to give me an Ay, or sorry, I have Y's here. These need to be X's. This is BX. This is AX. AY. Okay. And I know that this is two meters. I know this is four meters. And this is 1.5 meters. Okay. This is what I'm going to do because we're running out of time. Let me, give me a second. I wanna, let me see if I can chug some stuff out. I can tell you that AY is um, 33.544 kilonewtons upwards. And I can tell you that oh, I'm going to chug this out real quick. All right. Let me see if I'm getting the same thing that the book's getting because I want to check this. I know we're running short on time. All right. I am getting that uh, this is 107.5 um, uh, kilonewtons. And this is one or 107.26 kilonewtons, but AX is going to the left 
BX is going to the right. Now, what I'm going to do is this. For this problem, I'm giving you the answers. If you understood what we did on the, this problem here, you should be able to do this problem on, uh, on your own. Okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to go through this, and it doesn't have to be formal, but I want you to see if you get the same answers. Uh, and if you're getting the same answers I'm getting, then you should be able to tackle the homework on your own because the homework is pretty simple. It's pretty short. There's a similar beam problem and a somewhat similar structures problem. If you can get this, you'll be rocking and rolling. What we're going to do next week is we're going to continue our discussion of equilibrium. We're going to see if we can add a little bit of complexity to it, probably looking at cantilevered supports with fi or fixed supports, uh, and then see if we can dip our toes into 3D uh, near the end of the week. Uh, that's all I have, everybody. Um, everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, you all have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you all on Monday.